What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 204 at block height 610,041 on Friday, December 27th. So, uh, sadly, Rick is not with us today. Uh, he's feeling a little under the weather, but Nopar is back. What's going on, Nopar? Do you need. Hey guys, I finally got to a place where it's not 5 a.m. when the show is starting, so I can be here again. <laughs> Woohoo! Woo. So how was everybody's holidays? Digesting giant blocks of food. Yeah, I'm only coding like two hours a day, so I, I would say pretty good. Mm -hmm. So what, what did the cats just destroy, Janine? <laughs> Um, nothing. They're technically rolling around a ball of catnip that was originally in a wooden ball, and they managed to figure out how to get it out. <laughs> they are launching a cat coin. Lol. <laughs> so I guess, uh, before we dive into the, the show, uh... Does anybody else feel like the entire universe uh, has come to an end now that Mr. Robot's done? I haven't watched the last season, so I didn't even know that it ended. <gasps> You're in trouble, Janine. You're in big, big trouble. Is there a I... new season? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the whole series, like, the, it just ended Sunday. Last sh episode of the entire show. Awesome. Okay. I will keep that in mind. The last show that I was keeping up with in any uh, consistent manner was Walking Dead, and I stopped following that like a year ago, so I don't keep up with shows very well. I usually watch the recordings like years later. <laughs> That's a Shinobi trigger there. Don't do that with this one. You'll get things spoiled and it'll ruin the most amazing TV show ever made. I mean, I'm watching it, but because I invested so much time into it already, and, you know, I just, just, just want to see how it ends, but I don't enjoy it anymore for, it, like, three seasons already. It pays off, dude. It, it pays off. It, or, no, way. if you're talking about Walking Dead, fuck that show. <laughs> okay, though. Um, yeah. Uh, should we get into things? Um, or, or should we just do an episode on, uh, we'll, we'll do TV commentary today. I mean, come on, the, the, those those movie show review channels make buku bucks, guys. Don't don't you want to make money? No. No. You're weirdos. Okay, then I guess we'll just do uh, Bitcoin news. All right. So first up, um, the whole YouTube purge, the the government conspiracy to crack down on crypto. The indication that Google's secret cryptocurrency project is launching soon and they're stamping out the competition. Um, yeah, no. Um, like, I, I stayed completely quiet during this whole period of, of virtue signaling about the need for decentralized YouTube, which is not possible. Um, and, and all the, oh, we're, we're under attack. Because it was blatantly obvious that's not what was going on. Um, if you actually pay attention to YouTube as somebody who posts content there, YouTube has been spamming channel owners with messages about the new um, policy regarding content targeted towards children uh, for months now. And it, this is a reaction to literal pedophiles 
um, low key coordinating in the comment sections um, to find parts in videos of uh, fucking children because they're sick fucking pieces of shit. But if, if you know if you remember that happening months and months ago, um, this whole new policy change is a reaction to that, which is is in itself a very sticky issue because you have to deal with that. That is absolutely fucking sick and disgusting. But at the same time, you know we've already seen a huge wave of of negative effects for people not doing anything like that like there there are channels where, where pretty much all parents of autistic children uh make videos to help other parents who have children with autism and deal with their child and and find ways to to deal with the the problems that creates and you know those channels have been getting fucked with due to this slow shift to this new policy but you know the with with how fucked up and inaccurate and how gameable and high the false positive rates are for all of YouTube's automated filters cuz they they filter through everything you you post up there the audio the video everything um would not either you know false positive flag a bunch of shit or or go way past the point that YouTube actually intended the, this new policy to reach um you're a clueless moron who's not paying any attention to anything on the platform that you post your content to and that's just i i don't understand how a content creator is going to look at the the place they post their content for people to see and not pay attention to those kinds of things on the platform that's how you reach your audience so like re- really the, this whole situation to me just it shows uh, an insane amount of boredom in in this ecosystem because not much is going on because it everybody just instantly knee jerk virtue signaling oh we need to decentralize youtube but um you know, it was a fuck up on youtube's part they're not cracking down on anything related to crypto so like this whole thing is is just it's really, in in my mind, opened my eyes to a lot of people that I thought were much more intelligent than they actually are. I think you summarized the situation very well. One thing I would want to mention is that the complete lack of neutrality mindset in YouTube and in the some of the creators, so maybe most of the creators. <laughs> the the point would be to no one is responsible what people are using their creation to uh youtube should not be responsible what's in the videos the video creators should not be responsible what's in the comments the individual commenters if that's really such a case then they should be responsible for I don't know for exercising their free speech or whatever whatever they 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 are trying to as as you said organizing I don't even know if that's true organizing pedophilia <clears throat> crimes yeah. in the comment it, session I don't know okay like I I want to puke even just fucking saying this but they they, they were pretty much time stamping the sexy parts where they would jerk off in the fucking comments for each other and like sharing that around in in, in the fucking comments for videos with kids so it's like you 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 have to deal with that like end of story that that is not acceptable behavior in a civilized society period it's not acceptable morally but it's completely legal maybe if you really feel responsibility for that then you can ask your users your viewers to not be jerks or you can get them go into a direction that they are more i don't know morally less <clears throat> less problematic but seriously <laughs> banning people for 
because this is not not something that only happened to crypto users this is a general problem in youtube youtube is literally striking demonetizing banning creators for all kinds of non-issues and the reason is because youtube feels like they have the moral authority in some kind of in everything right that's happening on their platform and instead of improving their product they are concentrating on this thing well i mean this is just like you know these, these specific instances aside it's this is just something that these companies have to to realize um there is absolutely no way to solve this problem except two polar opposite extremes and there is no middle ground that works between them you either go towards whitelisting and nothing goes up except whitelisted shit or you go the complete opposite direction and let everything up and just leave it entirely up to the users what they want to filter out you cannot find a place in between those two points it's not scalable there are too many people, there are too many bots on the internet, and th there is just too much shit to sift through with human beings. And you cannot have computer algorithms that will accurately just handle this in an automated way without fucking up constantly. It's, it's just not possible. Uh, I agree with that. And it's like, you know, frankly, at this point, I think it's it's pretty obvious that YouTube is moving towards the whitelisting solution. On the other hand, what came to my mind uh, recently is that when you're on YouTube, like you, Shinobi, and you're clicking around videos, what happened back then, long time ago, when YouTube was in its early stages then? You were sometimes afraid of kicking on some videos because there is a huge scream that's going to <laughs> come out of your computer or some, some stupid things like that. So by no way I would I would agree what YouTube does, but this this creates this this atmosphere of of feeling somewhat safe on YouTube. I'm totally gonna have to edit that down a bit. So God, that was so loud. <laughs> Guys, you are not safe if you are listening to the digest. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but yeah, this this whole thing is just like I don't know. This whole space <clears throat> is full of way too many people who are knee jerky. Uh, reactionaries to literally everything without thinking anything through first and like it, it's starting to get to a really fucking absurd point and i think that the whole youtube situation kind of just illustrates that point for me perfectly yeah, anyway let's move on how about, how about dropping the meta all righty so Ruben Sampson, um, the creator of the, the state chain um, second layer protocol for Bitcoin, uh, just dropped a new type of design for a blind merge mining construct. Um, the, the original version of which was made by Paul Stork uh, for his drive chain concept. Um, and honestly, I'm... I'm still kind of thinking this through after reading it, so it's probably not going to have the, the best fleshed out explainer of this. But um, I, I, I was talking to, to Ruben the other day, and we're going to try to get him on uh, for a special edition soon to really go deep into this idea. But um, off the, the bat, um, I do not think that this in any way um, solves the incentive distortion problems of miners being involved with side chains like this. Um, and his GitHub write up uh, says as much as well on or at the end of the write up. <clears throat> like that's still kind of an open question. Um, I, I think it's an answered question. It, it's a distortion of incentives. 
But pretty much the idea is instead of Paul's wonky op code to lock things up and have this time enforced um, withdrawal mechanism and, and all of that, um, you could effectively using L2 um, and sig hash um, no input or um, I, I don't know what the hell they're calling it these days. Um, I'll get back to that when there's actually settled official names for these things. But um, using the, the basis of L2, you can pretty much create a, a string of signed transactions um, locking money into this um, where a miner can just mine this and you commit to the sidechain block in a, a taproot output. <clears throat> and what you can effectively do is create this string um, of L2 transactions where each one is relative time locked one block ahead of the, the one before it and pretty much create this um, uh, key signature where anybody can derive um, the, the key involved and move things forward um, and guarantee that only one of these commitments actually makes it into the Bitcoin chain per block. And so you pretty much can just use these set of pre-signed L2 transactions um, as the basis to commit to the side chain in the main chain. Um, and it, it pretty much works because any, anybody can take um, the, one of these pre-signed transactions and add um, a new input and output to pay the fee and commit to the side chain block. Um, because L2 is set up so that um, you're specifying exactly with the sig hash flags. So you can keep adding new things to it. And as long as the original input and output um, remain there, the transaction is still valid. And so it's, it's a new kind of mechanism um, to handle actually linking into the, the Bitcoin blockchain. And it doesn't require, I mean, it, it requires new um functionality in the base chain but not anything specifically made just to facilitate side chains like this um, this can be constructed with new um, op codes and sig hash flags that are just being planned in general for a, a bunch of other uses they provide and so you know it's pretty much um i'm, I'm kind of on the fences to maybe uh whether or not I want to yell at him a little bit uh, when we have him on, because this has taken something that I think is a very negative, damaging thing to Bitcoin in the long term because of how these types of side chains distort and interact with mining incentives in the long term. Um, but you know, there, there's a way to do this now um, without a, a special op code just for enabling these types of side chains, and. There's a little difference. Um, I, I'm still, again, trying to think through um, if you could facilitate a two-way peg without um, getting federations involved um, for that. But the, the basic design to pay fees and things on the side chain is a, essentially a proof of burn one-way peg into the side chain. And so... Right now, like I'm positive you can do that. That is the base token um, to pay fees in in one of these side chains. You burn it in and it can never come out again. Um, but you, you could have two-way pegs um, utilizing the side chain with federations as an anchor point with the main chain. But obviously, um, you're, you're having to trust the federation for that. Um, so I'm still kind of trying to think through if there would be a way for similar two-way pegs uh, without involving a federation. Um, you know, I've only really had a day to kind of sit and digest this, but it's a thing um, that's possible uh, with just some new features that we are already planning on adding um, just because of how useful they are for other things. And... I'm not sure whether to call this a positive thing or a negative thing. Um, you know, it's it's a thing. And there you go. We we'll see. Yeah. All right. So uh, if there's no inputs on that. All right. Next up is a issue with the Bitbox version two. 
And so I want to kind of take my time and slide through this uh, kind of slowly here. This um, is an attack on a device using the um, 608 secure element, um, which is also the secure element that the cold card Mark III uses. Um, and this chip has features that can be used to mitigate this specific attack um, that were not handled properly. Um, and it's, it, this is incredibly similar to the issue um, affecting the Mark I of the cold card, where you could um, bypass the, um, the rate limiter for pin entries that is supposed to exponentially um, increase the time you have to wait between pin tries. Um, but the BitBox had a chip, the secure element, that could actually mitigate that unlike the original cold card, which used the 508 secure element. And in the version two, they iterated the circuit design to make it harder to get between the MCU and the secure element to pull this kind of thing off. And then in the Mark III, they, they've upgraded to the, the 608 um, as far as the secure element. But pretty much um, what happens here is the, the counter um, in the MCU that, that actually marks um, and enforces this um pretty much doesn't actually increment the um entry attempt until um so pre pretty much you enter um the secure element does a check and then it goes back to the mcu to actually increment the attempt counter and pretty much um looking at uh how, how this works um in terms of code you either get a um failed message or if it passes, you get the pass message and the encrypted mnemonic seed to, to decrypt. And you can detect the difference between these two things in the, the voltage uh, with a power trace. So you can effectively just sit in between, or, or could, um, this has been patched, uh, the, the secure element and the MCU. Um, and when you see that it hasn't um, given the, the pass message, you just reset the MCU before it actually receives the message to increment the attempt counter. And so you can pretty much cycle through um, and just brute force pins. And if you, it, it's, it's pretty much the, the same kind of, of degree, I would say, um, regarding the cold card. Um, and then they're version of this issue. If you use a strong pin or passphrase, um, you're probably okay. But if you don't, physical access to this could have lost all of your money. And now that the, the, the details are out, this has been patched. Um, I, I just kind of want to take a second to point out um, the whole shit show uh, with the, the recent uh, change ransom attack on the cold card. Um, and the, the, the Trezor as well had a variation on that, that Shift just went around um, making a big PR push out of all these problems with other wallets. Um, and they literally have the exact same kind of vulnerability that a competitor wallet did, um, except they have the hardware that, that could mitigate that. Um, and they just quietly go, um, here's the firmware, um, it's a, a, a bad bug, fix it, and just downplay this. I didn't even see this until Lazy Ninja, the guy who actually found this bug, posted his report on it because of how low-key Shift played this after making a huge public shit show about how all the other fucking companies in this space need to handle disclosure more responsibly um, in terms of how they, they frame things to their, their customers. And I just, like, it's a joke. Like, they, they literally went through that entire wave of PR shit, pointing out flaws in other competitors in the last month, and then they literally have the exact same bug another wallet had, except they use hardware that could have stopped it. And they just low key, here's a patch and they downplay it. And it's, it's a complete fucking double standard in terms of how shit is handled. If it's a competitor, rail it home all day. If it's us, oh, here it is, there you go. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a fucking joke. 
the, the entire way that this last wave of issues with hardware wallets was played out and Schiff's involvement in that. Well, what's really funny is that the people involved with the last one, um, one of them is no longer at the company or soon will no longer be at the company. So they're not exactly keeping talent. Okay. Well, um, I guess somebody over there has some brains. All right. But I guess, uh, yeah, uh, that's pretty much all my venting on the topic. Uh, unless you guys have any comments, I think you're up next, Jeannie. Oh, what am I up next with? Are we doing the Ethereum um, stuff? You. Something about stakes and stake security. I, I actually want to hear this one. You know, I, I, I think my stakes are some of my most important possessions, and I want to keep them safe. Yeah, well, uh, the stakes are getting higher <laughs> for <laughs> Ethereum uh, because uh, Grant uh, Golovesson... Gul- Gullovson, yes, sorry. Uh, He's a licensed attorney in the state of Illinois, and he published a blog post on Christmas Eve, like interesting um, choice of date. uh, That the he he thinks uh, based on comments in the last month or two that the CFTC and the SEC will be looking at Ethereum's classification after the planned switch to proof of stake because uh, he thinks it will then satisfy at least three, if not four, of the four prongs of the Howey test. And those are an investment of money um, in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profits. And then the fourth one is derived from the efforts of others. And the last one is the one that he's less certain on because it depends on whether they determine that the Ethereum network is still sufficiently decentralized, quote, under the new consensus model and whether that status has changed at all since they made the last determination. Um, However, since it will be fairly clear, um, I mean, if you look at the Ethereum Foundation, um, one of the things that they use to determine decentralization is uh, whether there is an entity that has a, quote, leading or central role in the ongoing development of the network, including decisions on how to compensate persons providing services to the network and controls ownership of intellectual property property related to the network directly or indirectly, which is something that the Ethereum Foundation does, um, in addition to a number of other things that will be um, relevant. So he writes, do all of these factors um, indicating reliance on the efforts of the Ethereum Foundation for the success of Ethereum 2.0 mean that the SEC is going to reverse its previous held decision that the Ethereum network is sufficiently decentralized and find that ETH 2.0 as currently spec'd out um, involves investment contracts and therefore securities transactions? Of course not, but as the framework states, the stronger their presence, the more likely it is that a purchaser of a digital asset is relying on the efforts of others, and thus less likely that the network is sufficiently decentralized, so the fact that it is now back under SEC review means a reversal is entirely possible." End quote. So, yeah. um, Merry Christmas! (laughs) Oh my god, yeah. Uh, I completely forget who actually said this um, in that thread, but I saw one of the most potentially hilarious outcomes, and it's what I actually hope happens. Um, But he he was positing the idea that the Ethereum token itself um, does not become a security, but any Ethereum that is staked um does constitute a security and i just think that would be the funniest shit in the fucking world if it if it it was still like not dealing with a security if you were just transacting with or utilizing eth but if you staked it it was so like if only the the consensus process became like a regulated security but if you were just using it it wasn't so like the, the entire consensus process of the network would just get fucking choked by regulation. Like it would be the funniest shit in the world. 
Like, you know, that, that would be like, you know, miners in Bitcoin being declared like some kind of regulated entity um, that had to follow security laws or something. It would be so fucking priceless. It's like the guy who's just buying shit with ETH, not a security, but the guys facilitating the consensus process of the whole network, that's a security. That would be fucking priceless. Well, especially if you have a situation where, because if you think about it, and I mean, I believe in order to participate in this, you would have to run an Ethereum node. And how many people are able to run Ethereum nodes these days? Not very many. So basically, you're going to end up with a very small set of people um, who are running and maintaining the nodes, which means they're probably going to be involved in the um staking process a lot more than others and they they could easily they could easily say that you know because this main entity is is in a position to control law of the stake um the staking process then technically everyone else is relying on their efforts because without them uh they wouldn't like the system wouldn't be working at, at least it would have to shift to a different party, and that's not likely to happen because of how hard it is to enter the system. I just think it would be fucking hilarious if it created a situation where only accredited investors can stake their Ethereum and participate in the consensus process. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's my, my wish for the New Year's. Make that happen. All right, so... We want to slide along, I guess, into some other hilarious East news. Yeah, the only other kind of related thing is that um, Grubles noticed that um, there's a tweet. I've never, I haven't seen this account before, so I don't know. I don't know exactly what their goal is, but uh, Viewbase.com, that's their handle, uh, reported that 92,000 Ether were sent to Kraken. Um, and they pointed to a specific Ether address, and they believe, based on previous scanning or analysis, I guess, that that ETH had belonged to Vitalik. So this was either Vitalik send like moving the funds to his own address, or he was sending it um, to a another uh person and he apparently sent a lot um so i'm not sure exactly what that's based on but vitalik responded to say that this was fake news but he's also been involved in this thing with um the dot eth domain thing which is very not good for privacy and he doesn't seem to care about that and that's being encouraged in that space so people are basically doxing their money, um, some by accident, some because they don't care about privacy. And so it would not surprise me at all uh, if Vitalik was just not very good at keeping his funds more discreet and, you know, just sent a transaction to himself. I think it, uh, it wound up being uh, Jeff Wilk. Uh, one of the dozens of Ethereum co-founders I've never fucking heard of in my life. Uh, but yeah, when, when, when pressed um, for an explanation, he is is dumping this 90k ETH or whatever to fund development of a video game he wants to make. Sounds reasonable. Like a blockchain video game or just a video game? I don't know. The doesn't matter. It's probably more useful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is uh, yeah, it, it really is not the season for Ethereum. Like, it's like all their dirty laundry. It's just like raining down from the sky out in the open. And their explanations for it are just so pathetically cringe. Like, did, did you see Vitalik um, trying to say, like, he, he, he called the Ethereum presale uh, equivalent to mining when Bitcoin first launched because anybody could have participated? Mm, no, that 
that does not fit with the experience of people I know who actually were around at the time, and certain people were getting special offers to be involved, so no. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it's not on the news desk, but surprise! If you are running an Ethereum node, be prepared for the fork that's happening on New Year's Day. <laughs> because we like doing software updates on very uh, expensive networks um, during the holidays. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh open, open networks um, are like random and stuff, so the time can shift around. It wasn't supposed to be uh, January 1st. We just didn't think to make it far enough away that couldn't happen. You know imagine, what doing. imagine New Year's Eve. Three, two, one. Oops, it's gone. <laughs> oh, my oh my god, that would be the best fucking late Christmas present ever. Oh my god. Oh yeah, please, please, Santa. Come on. I don't care if it's late. Give me what I want. Alrighty. Uh I guess next up, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have some fun with this snow para. But uh, yes. the first time in a long fucking time, something happened on Bcash that's worth talking about. And this is this is amazing. This might be actually revolutionary. This might be the largest privacy improvement in bitcoin that happened since since my zero link research it's if it works of course because it's it's quite complicated and i'm not quite sure i i, I can't really just deduct it in in my own mind that oh yeah this this really works but let's let's look at what what this is this this is called cash fusion you might be you might be you might remember cash shuffle cash shuffle is a coin shuffle oh my god so many terms coin shuffle implementation of uh <clears throat> two bitcoin cash bitcoin cash's electrum client and those guys came up with with this thing called coin fusion wait cash fusion which is i think a pretty um pretty normal evolution of of of, of coin shuffle and, and all these coin join techniques because back in the day we were trying to figure out how how to even do it in a trustless way and for that uh, team ruffin came up with a uh, cash co coin shuffle and coin 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 shuffle plus plus and for that on that uh, that direction went the cash shuffle guys and we came up with the, the uh, zero link Xiaomi and coin join concept which which basically results in the exact same mixes but uses a different uh, ways how you are provide how do we how you endure trustlessness anyway uh, we figured this out we solved it we implemented it and now it's a uh, coin joints are in production uh, what <clears throat> what is really missing is that doing unequal amounts of coin joints or doing the most block space efficient coin joints that we can do and what this cash fusion thing does is actually it has two parts in one part it figures out how to do the whole thing trustlessly so let me read just the essence of it the approach in cash, fu cash fusion is to have each player make cryptographic commitment to each of their transaction components both inputs and outputs uh, when there is a problem with the transaction each player proves each component individually to one of the other players in a group chosen randomly uh, 
this basically means that uh, when you want to do a coin join, then you you can use arbitrary amounts of inputs and arbitrary amounts of outputs. It's not really arbitrary because there is a limit of 21. So you can use 20 inputs and one output or 20 outputs and one inputs anyway. So, <clears throat> but, 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 but the point is that if it works, and I, I, I actually think this part works uh, because this is, this is a difficult part, but this might not be the most difficult part to figure out because I had a bunch of things in mind to previously. Um, so, yeah, if you come with a bunch of inputs and one a bunch of outputs arbitrary amounts, then with this scheme, in theory, you can actually construct coin joins with other people. Uh, and that's that's really awesome because then you can send other people any amount of money in this coin joins so that's that's exciting now uh let's move on to the second part because that's what what might be the revolutionary part where you know in order to hide in a crowd you have to have the exact same amount of Bitcoin, so so that's what you call mixing. Now the realization that this cash fusion guys came up with is that in cash fusion we have opted to abandon the equal amount concept altogether. What? Seriously? What? <laughs> okay. While this is a first glance no different than an old na naive schemes mathematical analysis shows it in fact becomes highly private by simply increasing the numbers of inputs and outputs for example with hundreds of inputs and outputs it is not just computationally impractical to iterate through all partitions but even with infinite computing power think about quantum computers in 100 years from now one would find a large number of valid partitions which like if that would be really the case that would be awesome uh i i remember heard about this logic in in the knapsack paper back in 2017 and i came with the with the argument eh, okay but uh, what i really want to to look at is, is target only one user so okay here is an input that's coming in a coin join and then where can it go so okay the transaction might have 500 different interpretations that input can only have like 10 different interpretations or something like that but remember in this scheme you can came in with multiple inputs so it's like it it, it gets really confusing uh, I, i'm again i'm not not convinced of the math but but this this has to be explored and if it really works like that that means we can construct coin joins with arbitrary amount of inputs with arbitrary input amounts with arbitrary amount of outputs with arbitrary output amounts almost as naively as you would do bitcoin transactions or just merge together all the bitcoin transactions in one block with schnorr let's say and and that would actually provide you sufficient amount of privacy because of this 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 combinatorics that they are talking about here and yeah i i definitely will look into it much more in the future so what's what's what was your take on this uh, shinobi well i mean <laughs> i think it's very very possible that the mathematics of that maps out but i think a big part of that comes down to economic like practicality um yeah sure you can do this no problem on bcash um 
But in the long term, think about it. Uh, if you maintain your on-chain privacy, but that chain marches towards a world of data center nodes where you can't even use neutrino filters, then you lose all of that privacy on the network level. So it's really, you're kind of just lying to yourself in the long term. Um, so really, I think the issue is like how how well does this translate to Bitcoin if the math actually checks out? Because like we would not be able to be as totally arbitrary about things as you can on Bcash. Like there will be a threshold point where we can't really start dealing with amounts below that threshold because it's just not cost effective. Like that that's not going to be an economical thing that a large group of people will pay for. So, you know, if this math checks out, like, yeah, this could wind up being very beneficial to coin joins on Bitcoin, but I don't think it will fully translate um, to our side of things, um, you know, based on the performance on Bcash. Like, we're not going to be able to get as small or arbitrary or numerous with things. Um but, you know, this does have me thinking, um, you know, potentially how you could kind of use this logic in combination with uh, Jeremy Rubin's op hold the bag, uh, where, where you could kind of create covenants based on outputs. You know, could we use some of the logic in here to have a coin join that just dumps everything into one output? And then that just breaks down in pre-signed transactions so that you don't really have a static anonymity set from that mix. You have an evolving dynamic one that depends on like how far people roll out those pre-signed transactions. You know what I mean? Because you can you can get it to the point where like let's say we get down the tree of transactions to an output that's entirely mine. I can have that top level key in the, the taproot scheme to spend that, like just do whatever I want with it. But I could also still put some op hold the bag like fields and break that up further. And then I have a choice now. Like, do I want to let people know that this input is, is all me? Or do I want to break it up a little more and kind of, you know, really start to rethink how the, the anonymity set thinking and coin joins work to, to really try to get as much block space efficiency as we can. Okay. That, that might work too. I'm not sure I can judge it. Uh, I, I want to come back a bit about the mat that you said, if the mat checks out, if the mat math checks out that means we don't have constraints because right now we were trying to come up with schemes those are making sure that one plus one is two but if one plus one is two but there are so many one plus ones that they become accidentally true in enough amount of times <laughs> if you know what i mean that means it actually removes our limitations on how we can actually work on these things in in the future uh, and it, it just means that we were way too cautious about making sure that one plus one is two and did not consider that oh yeah but there are so many one plus one kind of computations that it's computationally too expensive with today's computers. And even if someone can compute it, there is so many one plus one accidental tr two uh, results that it doesn't really matter at all, you know? Anyway, so yeah, it, 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 I, I think about it as removing their limitation that we had so far with, with some, 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 I, I don't even want to say it's advanced math. It's, it's probably not. I'm, I'm just too stupid to, to understand, uh, should revisit combinatorics. Yeah. 
but yeah we will see uh, i will definitely look into it much more seems like i need to go harass my mathematics slash cryptography oracle and see what he says about this <laughs> he'll say nothing much <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, uh, yeah, I guess uh, I'm pretty much plumbed out with my thoughts on that. How about you? Yeah, I'm good too. So I have two more topics, right? That's that's me. Uh yeah, but I think Janine's um up first with an update on uh a possible criminal we haven't heard about in a while. Oh, okay. Yeah, so according to the Russian embassy from Greece, um, the alleged operator of BTC, Alexander Vinnik, uh, is going to be extradited to France instead of back to Russia, his home country, uh, for trial. Um, And he's currently going on hunger strike as a result of that decision um there was let's see where did it, uh the uh, there was a representative from the embassy who said that um we're sorry to see that the reasonable request from Russia's prosecutor general about Vinnik's extradition to his country of citizenship was ignored um and i guess the uh yeah, that basically that's going to happen. So he's going to be extradited to France instead of Russia for the money laundering charges. Um, I'm not sure if he's because uh, the, the U.S. Justice, Justice Department apparently had a um, 12 million dollar fine against him personally since July 2017. I don't know if they've actually tried to. Um, recover that money or if they have already i don't know but it's noted that they have a fine outstanding fine against him i'm kind of curious as to what the judge's rationale here was like was was this just a like looking at like america and russia and just going fuck both of you and sending him to france just to not cater to a fucking superpower Yeah, I don't I don't know exactly what the reasoning is cuz I'm not as familiar with BTCE stuff, so does he have any connection to France whatsoever? Cuz actually the... he's, he's currently being held in Greece, so I don't know what the connection is to Russia or what the connection is to France. Just just the the basis of the the money laundering charges and shit there. I'm I'm betting they're just pushing hard because of a uh... There's probably a decent amount of French citizens who uh, traded on BTC. It was a that was like the bucket shop uh, in its heyday. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's starting to get kind of weird, honestly, when I see little updates on things like this, and it's just like, holy shit, that this is still like not resolved. Like this has been going on for like two years now. Yeah. Yeah, it says the fine is from 2017, so it's been over two years now. That good old government efficiency. All right. Well, I guess uh, yeah. If there's nothing else on that, uh, guess you're back up, Nopara. And these are two very strange stories, I think. Hmm. So Cyber Trace. A blockchain analysis company has partnered with the Anti-Human Trafficking Intelligence Initiative to track cryptocurrency transactions from suspected traffickers. Uh, Good for them. Next up, new ransomware, Maze, took ransomwares to a new level. They, now they, they, you know, ransomwares usually just lock your file and 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 ask money for it but they are actually transferring your files to their servers which is actually not which is actually quite a a large uh, challenge technological challenge to be honest but anyway they transferring your files to your servers and then among um, many of your files they make it public uh, if you don't pay and 
maybe your most important file is that your public keys that's on your computer so they make public uh, which bitcoins belongs to you what's your history and similar which made me bring back an old idea of mine that you could actually create a ransomware blockchain analysis company right you could just analyze the blockchains figure out who has how much money which money they belong to then send emails to people hey can you pay for me because if not i will just tell the world that how much money you have and what you what you use that for <laughs> you know that's uh that's that's getting very very similar to 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 this this kind of scheme that we have not seen before that is a thought i had not even considered that yeah that is is scary to think about yeah this like i don't know the the whole cipher trace like human trafficking thing though it's like really like i i do not buy at all that any significant volume of that is being facilitated with cryptocurrencies like bullshit but if you 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 get one pedophile that worth it that worth it no the point is like this that is entirely pr for that company like any kind of volume in human trafficking being done with cryptocurrency is such an insignificantly small fraction of the total flows of money involved in that. You're not going to do anything. You're going to catch a few low hanging fruits or retards and that's it. Like you're not going to do anything to fundamentally deal with the full scale of that problem with blockchain analysis like that's a meme yeah it, it and and what if it it does what if it stops 50 percent of the of the what if bitcoin takes over the world and every transaction will go through bitcoin so by extension it's going to or the all the human trafficking transactions are going through with Bitcoin. So what would you say to that? Would Cypertrace would be rightfully partnering with ITII uh, in order to to track the, the people or or not? Maybe. No, I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything immoral or, or wrong in trying to stop that at all use every tool you have at your disposal but we're not in that world right now and we're not going to be in that world for a very long time so what this is actually accomplishing is a pr a pr spin like you're you're not taking down human trafficking with blockchain analysis right now and even in a, a world where everybody's using bitcoin you're, you're not going to do that by just tracking bitcoin you're going to do that by finding people surveilling people surveilling their communications tracking where they go physically like it, you know it's like the, this whole meme of, of blockchain analysis to deal with crimes is a joke because that blockchain analysis is completely worthless without all the other real world investigation that creates identities and people and actions that you tie all of those money flows to. If you don't do all that other investigative work, blockchain analysis is useless. I don't know. I mean, let's assume it is useful. Then, yes, you, as you said, you should do everything that at your disposal. You should use every tool that at, at your disposal, but that just highlights uh, if you have a tool and you are successfully doing something 
good with it. That's not a problem. The problem is when you want to push that tool to get more and more influence and make Bitcoin completely unprivate uh, because you were able to do something good with that tool. But using money is not the crime. Uh, human trafficking is the crime. Um, <clears throat> So my point is that the it's okay if you are doing things, if you are tracking, let's say, human traffickers, but it's not okay if you are trying to push your propaganda to <clears throat> make sure that everyone else loses their privacy because of some human traffickers. There are 7 million people in this world and let's say 1000 really human trafficker that works to 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 catch uh that that actually makes a difference and i i don't think that losing our privacy for for 1000 people uh makes sense so so yes do it but don't push don't push your bullshit into to other things that's that that's 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 what really bothers me right because this is so propagandist uh yeah blockchain or is this uh <clears throat> come together with human traffic intelligence initiative whatever that that thing is doing uh <laughs> yeah and by the time we're in a world where everybody's using Bitcoin, where that could actually make a meaningful difference, they're going to be out of business or we all fucked up royally somewhere along the way. Yes. Yeah. And then like this fucking ransomware shit though, like on that, like that's, that's a whole new dimension that I had never even considered before. Yeah, you see, this this comes together right here, right here in this story that <laughs> ransomware was the main argument of blockchain analysis. <laughs> now the ransomware is basically doing a very, very basic form of blockchain analysis, just spying on your hard drive. <laughs> and now it it slowly becomes an argument against blockchain analysis. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's like so weird to think like how has nobody done this before? You know what I mean? The, like the the pay rates aren't really that great from what I remember reading about it, and it's like how is how has this not been done before? Like pay us. Or we just dump all of your data publicly. Like, that is such a bigger incentive to pay them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, uh, and I think I know the answer. It's because it's it's very difficult to make sure that you transfer the, the data to your server, right? You infect 100 computer and let's say you don't want to transfer the large files, but still that that server of yours is still uh, a point that people can track you back maybe to, you know what I mean? It's, it just, you don't want to create that, that, that point of failure right there. And, and also if you think about all the Bitcoin developers in the space, they're not gonna write a fucking ransomware. People who, who know how to do that, they're not gonna do it because we can get a job anywhere, you know, and would pay probably even higher than than what we are doing right now, you know. <laughs> uh, so it it just it just not not in our interest. I mean, so people who are competent in that in in this, they they just don't 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 give a fuck or. They might be good people or they might don't want to risk it. But yeah, we, personally, I'm just not, I, I never been interested in hacking. In fact, 
I was always looking at people who are hacking around that as a lesser kind of developers that uh, please build build the things that last and don't just hack it together that only lasts for a week. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, data exfiltration is probably one of the hardest parts of any kind of hack like that to try to get data out of something. But I mean, really, how hard do you think it would be for you just, just go compromise a, a couple servers just to, to set up a torrent ring between them and then dump your data there? You get out whatever you get out before, you know, systems start triggering warnings and, and alerting people and you just let it circulate on the torrent. And I mean, like, you can think about that. Like, you could just keep adding compromised systems to the torrent as people figure out they've been compromised and take shit down. Like, you could probably keep, you know, some exfiltrated data circulating for quite a while doing that if you did that right. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder. I never worked with torrent programmatically. Yeah, it's Maybe like... it's not that hard. If ransomware is going to get really interesting when the people who aren't idiots start taking a look at it. <laughs> Alrighty, who's up next? I am. Okay. Um. Yeah. So this, I just, I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Okay, this is so loosely related to Bitcoin. Um, it, it, it's, it's got almost nothing to do with it. I just wanted to go woo. Because uh, Trump's thinking about doing something fucking awesome. So the White House right now is considering passing an executive order that would change how the publication of any scientific research that had federal funding works. Um, pretty much right now, all the academic databases that price gouge the fuck out of anybody who actually wants to get their hands on real research for something have a 12 month moratorium period um where they can paywall uh published research that received federal funding before they're mandated to make it freely accessible um with no encumbrances um and and just getting rid of that 12 month period so that any kind any published research that has received any federal funding from the US government upon publication would have to instantly be made available completely openly and without any kind of paywall or financial restrictions and this if he does this is fucking huge that is a kick in the dick to these institutions that just lock up scientific research behind paywalls. They make you pay for it when in a lot of cases you, you already have paid for it when, when you paid your taxes and they got some federal research grant to do something. So like, this is not at all just all the, the information is free and open now. But if he does this, this would be a huge step in the right direction in terms of how access to that kind of academic research is handled and pretty much just walled off. And that would be fucking awesome. That I think would be a huge boon to just the number of eyes on and building off of research in general in, in all scientific fields. And so, yeah, I really fucking hope he does this. I completely agree. This is a huge issue for me to personally that I want to look into something and there is a paywall. And even when I pay, <laughs> it's not even cheap, man. Never mind. Yeah, don't fucking charge hundreds of fucking dollars for one research paper. It's fucking crazy. But like, yeah, th this this would be a huge step in a positive direction and is really no telling or quantifying what the positive effects of that would be where 
goofballs like me and Nopara can actually just go read a, a good chunk of what we want to read instead of pay out the ass for it just to, to actually learn how something works. It, it's not just that, but very often you just just want to glance into something, right? <laughs> you just want to mm-hmm. figure out if this thing is useful and the abstract is just not, doesn't tell you that much. So, yeah, it's, it, it's it, I, I don't know how much, how much of the, all the research that's been paid well, is actually financed by the American federal government. So I don't know if it's really that huge, but anyway. At least research done in America, it's going to be a lot of it. But yeah, and I guess, uh, you know, next up is just a quick update uh, about BACT. Uh, We talked a little bit ago how the CEO, Kelly Loeffler, was appointed uh, to finish out the current uh, senator from Georgia's term. Uh, So she's going to be sworn in on January 1st, and that obviously legally requires her to step down from all of her positions related to ICE and BACT. Um, So... Adam White, uh, the company's uh, chief operating officer, is taking over as company's president, and Mike Blandia is taking over as CEO. So uh, White, uh, you guys may remember from last year, uh, jumped ship over to Bact from Coinbase uh, right after they started rolling. And Mike Blandia has a a bit of a history working with payments um, at Google, uh, PayPal. He actually was the engineering director at Google's uh, wallet, PayPal, Apple Pay, whatever the fuck that thing is. Um, And pretty much they're concentrating on two things now that they actually have the futures and a few products built on top of those launched um one building out the the warehouse um which they've actually signed galaxy digital um mike novogratz's um investment fund on um to use their warehouse for storage and um the the new ceo and president are planning on moving forward with their efforts to um create a consumer uh, payment system to facilitate the the Starbucks and Microsoft little purchases using Bitcoin and and giving those companies the the way to hedge their their price exposure and and all of that back uh, on the back end linked into their futures products and shit. So um, we've had a change of the guard there. Uh, The former CEO is now a member of the United States government in a few days. And they have again, explicitly recommitted to building out a system that would actually allow retail use of Bitcoin uh, at companies who signed up to use that platform. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think things are going exactly uh, like we said they would when back first launched. Uh, This is going to be a slow, chugging and steadily building beast and that seems to be exactly how things have played out so far i mean like how how, how weird is that going to be no para in a year or two if you can go walk into a starbucks and buy bitcoin which gets settled over something ran by the owners of the nasdaq um and that's just the thing you can do i mean very similar things are happening in Taiwan where you can just walk into a family mart, which is even more frequent than Starbucks and you can buy Bitcoin there or buy family mart gift cards with Bitcoin. But yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's good. It just usually the user experience of this kind of things are not the most straightforward, so to say. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's like, you know, I, th- I think over the next year or two, um, we're going to see a lot of Bitcoiners um, screaming, uh, take this mainstream, uh, do a complete about face 
and start screaming about how they don't like what mainstream looks like. Uh, I, I, th- I think we're going to see a lot of that in the next year or two. <laughs> I will be. I will be one of them. <laughs> I probably will too. But what are you going to do? Scream. Alrighty. So I guess you're up for the last two. Uh, what, what's going on with uh, uh, the, the Congress over there? I saw scooters. Peter Woolley was was tweeting about scooters. Oh, um, I have not seen anything about scooters yet. Um, but yeah, so if you guys aren't familiar with the one of the, I'm pretty sure it's one of the, if not the largest, hacker conference besides DevCon and maybe Black Hat, but you don't want to go to either of those. Um, definitely not DevCon <laughs> because it's like thirty percent FBI agents. Um, but yeah, this is one of the biggest hacker conferences in the world in Leipzig. It's been in a couple of different cities over the years in Germany, but now it's in Leipzig and this is 3063. So it's the 36th, uh, annual conference. And, uh, the title of this event is resource exhaustion. They always try to pick clever, um, computer science related names for their events and the one so basically it started today um the talks that have already happened if you want to see those you can go to media.cc.de if you want to see the streaming ones you can go to just a second let me get the link if you want to see the streaming ones you can go to where did i put it uh streaming.media.ccc.de so the same link but with streaming in front and then 36 uh, slash 36 C3. Um, the one really interesting talk that already happened today was from Andy Mueller Magoon, who was one of the people who was targeted by um, UC Global's um, surveillance of the Ecuadorian. Em- oh. Kitty attack! Oh, no, I, I thought I disconnected for a second. Um, anyway. He was a target of the surveillance of the Ecuadorian embassy in London. And um, because he was one of the victims and also because he's an investigative journalist, he decided to make some of the photographs and emails uh, public. Um, The photos being the images that UC Global not only took of people's devices who were supposed to be guests, but the photos that they took when they were setting up the surveillance equipment in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, including apparently the fire, something to do with the fire extinguisher and putting in lasers because they had to better pinpoint the audio capture because uh, Assange had installed a white noise machine so that he could have private conversations. Um, yeah, so they documented their basically violation of his rights, which is great in retrospect that they did that because it basically means we have evidence of all of this and where the stuff was and how extensive it was. So I definitely recommend checking out that talk. Um, It should be available very soon because it was one of the first talks of the day. Uh, You can find that at the media.ccc.de link uh, slash recent. Um, So definitely check that one out if you haven't. And um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, there's, there's always really great talks every day of this event. I think it goes for three days. Um, So today, the 27th, the 28th and the 29th. Um, Yeah. So just a great event to check out over the holidays, the rest of the holidays. Things to watch. So what happened with the scooters? Oh, he just posted a picture of a, a parking thing for scooters um, in the warehouse or wherever they were having it. And I, I I just thought that was silly. Of course, a bunch of hackers decided that they all need scooters covered in LED lights to, to zoom around the conference. Well, and another thing I want to point out is that one of the reasons I like CCC so much is because they have a no photography policy, which means that if you want to take photos of anyone, including like as part of crowd shots you have to ask their permission um if you don't do that especially with crowd shots you and you post them on social media you're going to get a ton of angry messages uh so it's definitely a great place to be if you're if you're uh photophobic 
Um, and I wish more events did that. Yeah, that that is an irritating thing to deal with every time I go somewhere in person. All right, so uh, I guess does that wrap us up? It's a wrap. Nothing more. All righty then. You know what time it is, guys. You have to think of something smart to say now. Okay. It should not be a problem. Go, somebody. So my final thought is that I'm going to be talking at the Advancing Bitcoin conference in London in February. And uh, I think this is a conference that worth visiting. It's not as large as the Breaking Bitcoin conference. It, it's the second ed, second conference, actually. But last time when I was there, it was really crowded with people who are doing stuff in the space, which was quite refreshing. Like, you did not go into anyone and turned out he's a noob. No, you went into someone bumped into someone oh he's Danny Brewster oh wow oh, I heard a lot about you or one of the co-founder of chain or is or things like that so so I think it's 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 going to be an interesting conference again I hope oh, I have to check that one out uh where is it at uh the London. UK okay. boom all right Janine does the does, does a kitty have a thought today can we get a kitty thought no, Kitty is sleeping. Um, my my final thought uh, wasn't mentioned during the last show, but since this is going to be our last show of the year, I think. Yeah. Um, it was Chelsea Manning's 32nd birthday on December 17th, uh, which is pretty... It sucks because she's still in jail, and she's now 32, which means that she's spent a whole third of her life in some type of jail somewhere, which really sucks. So hopefully there's going to be a better outcome this year in terms of getting her out and ending this stupid grand jury thing, um, which is why the UC Global investigation is so important because if Assange was not able to properly prepare his case because of the Belmarsh circumstances, but also if he, uh, if evidence that the U S justice department uses was obtained illegally, um, and there's parallel construction involved, then that could seriously undermine the extradition trial. Um, that's going to happen in the UK. So hopefully that happens. Yeah. That, would be good like we yeah this country has not had a good history over the last two decades with people telling the truth all right and i guess uh yeah my final thought is hopefully uh by the end of the new years or by the by the new years um can shoot out a couple of shy 256s that have been on the back burner because I've been busy with other stuff and uh, you guys can listen to me rant about things but on that note uh, I guess see you guys next year bye <laughs> Yeah, you can have a voice, you're yet. Yeah, you see it, Nick. Yeah, I see it. It is so good, Mario.